Welcome to episode 179 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about people in Canadian theatre featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. In a couple of weeks, you will hear my conversation with Miriam Goldstein and Blythe Haynes from the Edge Productions and Gangway Theatre as we talk about their upcoming production of Pregnancy Pact. But even before that happens, I wanted to tell you that we have a special deal for you on that show. If you go to edgeproductions.ca and enter the code STAGEWORTHY when you check out, you will get 20% off the ticket price. Pregnancy Pact opens in Toronto on May 2nd and runs until May 19th. Now I want to talk about, as I have been for a little while, Today Ticks. And by now you've figured out that I really do love Today Ticks. Today Ticks, for those that don't know, is an app and website that offers easy and affordable access to a wide variety of must-see cultural performances from plays and musicals and also to dance, opera, comedy, immersive experiences, and so much more. I want to take a look at the Today Ticks app and uh, see what they have on this week. Um... Okay, here's some great timing. Uh, the Stratford Festival opens this week with Billy Elliot, and Today Ticks has discounted tickets to all the Stratford Festival shows. So you should get on that as soon as you can. I also see amazing prices on Guarded Girls at Tarragon and Angelique at the Factory Theatre. Today Ticks makes ticket buying simple, and you can purchase tickets in less than 30 seconds. Get it on iOS and Android, or go to todaytakes.com. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I would love to remind you that subscribing is the best way to make sure that you never miss an episode of Stageworthy. Subscribing is easy. Just go to Apple Podcasts or Google Music and search for Stageworthy and click the subscribe button. If you want to drop me a line, remember that you can find Stageworthy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at StageworthyPodcast.com. And if you want to drop me a line, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby, and my website is PhilRickaby.com. My guest this week is Ted Dykstra. Ted is one of the co-engineers of the Coal Mine Theater who present the Canadian premiere of Hand to God, running April 21st to May 12th at the Coal Mine Theater in Toronto. So why don't I, I guess the best place to start would be uh, at Hand to God. And um, who are you playing in Hand to God? You're the, Pastor uh, Greg. Pastor Greg, okay. And you're, uh, I mean, I've read the play. I know it's, I know it's a weird one. Um, what, what drew you to, to Hand to God? Uh, a friend of mine saw it in New York and um, uh, he said, you guys, it's such a coal mine play, you got to do it. And so I I ordered it and read it, and I loved it, and uh, we got the rights. Mm. And that, that's, it's that simple. When when somebody describes it as a, as a coal mine play, what do you think that means? Uh, generally dark. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, rough content, in, I guess, uh, that some could consider, you know, blue or... Um, Censor worthy in some way, just just not 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 family fair, I mm. guess, adult fair, but black humor and um, good writing, yeah. uh, great characters, great writing mostly is a coal mine play. It's great writing. Well, Hand of God certainly does have that, and yeah. it, it certainly uh, you know it subverts a lot of the ideas of the of you know what happens in a fundamental church and things like that. And, yeah, yeah. Um, just. Just to, what, what do you see? I mean, for for I know Pastor Greg has some particular challenges in in the play, oh, kicking things all over the place. Um, what do you what do you what do you see as as the the biggest challenge that that Pastor Greg, aside from you know the possessed puppet, what, what do you think um, uh, Pastor Greg? Uh, deal with well, I th- you know, on one level, the part is very difficult because the thing about comedy is you have to be real, and so you have to understand there's a style that's comedic, but at the same time, you have to root it in uh, something that's believable, mm-hmm. and so just getting getting that um, 
getting that tone right is a great challenge as an actor and mm. uh, something that I enjoy and that I'm also scared of. So mm. I like to do things that scare me. And he has a great journey. He's in love mm -hmm. um, with a woman in his congregation and she really is not in love with him. And, mm -hmm. um, and he, he actually has to come to a place of understanding that when you love, you have to love all the sides of someone or humanity and that everybody has a dark side. Mm -hmm. and, and the play, you know, just definitely touches on those things. And you don't want to miss those things and just be a comedy. Yeah. Um, so he, he sort of comes into his own at the end and, and does actually help this fractured family, this, this mother and son who've lost the dad, um, come together, hopefully. You, you, you talked about the, the danger of, of, playing, of playing comedy, and, and, and this play being, is, is well written, but it's also very funny, and it can be, um, I, I think that there's a, there would be, there could be the danger of falling into like a, a sitcom -y, uh, attitude towards mm -hmm. it. For sure, yeah. for sure. And how, are there things that you, that you do to remind yourself or to, to watch for that? Well, I mean, that's Mitchell's job, our director. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's, he's the one who ultimately decides on what the tone is in a given scene and, yeah. and throughout the whole play. And so it's, it's about trusting him and um, mm -hmm. knowing that he will see it from the outside. Because when you're on the inside, you can't see it as clearly. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> I would like to, to talk to you a little bit about, about your, your, your theater origin story and, and sort of what what brought you to a life in the theater and, and that, that brought you to, to coal mine. So what, what, how did you first become interested in theater and how did you know that? that I started theater? acting as a child in my hometown of St. Albert, Alberta with an amateur company. And whenever there was a kid's role, I, I got it. Mm -hmm. My first big part was second bird in once upon a clothesline. And, uh, <laughs> I got a lot of laughs and I liked that. <laughs> um, I liked that feeling. Uh, I've always been a performer. Classical music was a big part of my childhood and, and performing and uh, competing in competitions. And I started acting professionally in Edmonton when I was 15. They had a, a role for a 15 year old in a play called The Broken Globe by Frank Mower. And um, it was a world premiere. And um, that's what got me my start mm. and I acted in Edmonton professionally for about five years um, and then I went to the National Theatre School in uh, Montreal because mm. as a classically trained pianist I always also wanted to be a classically trained actor mm. and uh, um, I sort of revere the the old ways and the classics in in both theatre and in music um, so that was a love of mine and the National Theatre School at that time more so than now was very much dedicated to classical text and classical acting and um and that really appealed to me so i went there for three years and then i came to toronto and you know i've been working ever since i've been at stratford and shaw and um all over the country uh two pianos four hands was done mm -hmm. around the world and uh yeah i've had a great life i, I no complaints I, I love the theater it's my life for yeah. sure when you were making that transition you know when you started acting professionally when you were 15 was there ever a moment where you wondered if that was what you were going to do, or did you always know? I knew. Yeah? I knew yeah. from the time I was 15, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. remember what it was that, that, that drew you at 15? Because some people will do a play when they're when they're young, but they don't pursue that. What was it about it that made you so certain that it was going to be your life? Um, I'm not sure. I, I just think it. you know, if you're lucky enough to find something that you're good at and that people... Uh, enjoy and encourage you and and you get to make a living doing it it's mm -hmm. kind of a no-brainer like I, I sort of I, I don't know if I fell into it I worked hard I I, I studied um, I saved money and and took classes uh, when I was 15 with professional actors and um, you know I, I left St. Albert uh, at 17 and lived by myself in the city and worked and mm -hmm. and uh, came to Montreal without a penny and got a student loan and and you know I worked hard I really mm -hmm. um I'm proud of of all I did uh to to get here yeah so hard work is yeah, really yeah. what did it yeah. um and then <clears throat> you you so you you actually the, the creation of of the of the two piano four hands um was what what was behind the creation of that show? Did 
Um, me and Richard Greenblatt knew each other. We'd never really worked together. Um, he has a very similar childhood to mine in that he was a, a classical piano player uh, who did competitions. And he was in Montreal growing up. I was in Edmonton, St. Albert. And um, we would talk and we would have so many of the same experiences talking about teachers and competitions mm-hmm. and summer music camps and uh, being a piano nerd and having opinions about <coughs> classical music and classical players and um, it was the first time I'd met an, a professional theater artist who was as good a piano player as me. So we also had a bit of competition um, mm-hmm. and with each other. Like I'd listen to him and I'd go, wow, he, he, he did the scales. He did his work um, and uh, he's in the theater now. And um, we'd always be talking about it. And Andy McKim, who at that time uh, was running the Tarragon Theater with Urjo Carita, uh, said, you guys should stop talking about this and and get in a room and see what you can come up with. Mm-hmm. And he encouraged us to do that. And it was through that encouragement that we, we started coming up with the show. And that show, that show, like you said, you, you've taken that, that show's gone all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. We played New York and, uh, Washington and London, England and Birmingham, England, and, um, every city in Canada several times. <laughs> and I've directed it in, in America. I've directed it in Australia Richard's directed it all over the place. Um, we've ourselves have performed it over 900 times, 950, I think. Uh, we've been to Japan a couple of times. It's been incredible. Yeah. yeah. How did how I mean? How does a show go from you know the show that you that you that you make up to something that that, that ends up going around the world? What's the like? You- I wish I knew. I because <laughs> I would have done it more than once. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the all I all I know about it is that when you do a show and people come backstage and they talk about themselves, that's what a hit is. Mm. So mm. if people talk about themselves rather than you, mm. um, then you know you're onto something yeah. because then they've seen themselves on the stage and they get incredibly excited and they really feel that they need to talk to you right. uh, about their own experience mm. and how it relates to what they just saw. And I, I've noticed that with any hit play. Yeah. Um, that's what it is. Did you find that wherever you went, people were coming back and talking about themselves? Absolutely. Yeah. In Japan, in um, England, in America, all across Canada, mm. no question. That's that's everybody wants to talk about themselves after the show. Did you? Do you, I mean, does, is there a point where you you think you know I actually want to talk about me, or are you very happy? <laughs> no, I'm I'm uh, good. I'm good. I'm not that. <laughs> I'm not that interesting. <laughs> so so. Are there are there similar themes that people are talking to you about when they're coming back? Uh, no, it's quite different. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I, we've had lawyers come back and say, you know, I never took piano, but that's what the law field is like. It's mm-hmm. like there's there's a because in, in two pianos four hands we talk about, you know, are you the best in the world? And if you're not the best in the world, why are you doing it? Um, mm-hmm. Of course, that eliminates a couple of billion people so yeah. why would we do anything yeah uh so it's about where you place yourself in the world and how you how you value what you the work that you did and you mm-hmm. know tennis is the same tennis is uh we've had tennis players say it's a lot like like the tennis world the, the rarefied world of the people who are seated mm-hmm. you know one to 32 and, and and then the rest of them um and we got to think about where at the end of the play we say we're two of the best piano players in the neighborhood <laughs> and that's kind of the theme of of the show mm-hmm. is is that there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. There's, there's nothing wrong with with being one of the best in the neighborhood, mm-hmm. um, and that we can still go home and enjoy. And but people talked about going home and playing for the first time in years that mm-hmm. they hadn't touched the piano, and the show inspired them to go. So what if I'm not the best? I still love it. Why did I stop? Mm-hmm. You know, other people had real traumatic breakups with piano and it was a really horrific experience bad teachers Mm -hmm. so we had a lot of that we had the the fights you have with your parents about going into the arts as opposed to you know being a doctor and um it's kind of endless it it, Mm because the family dynamic is there and um it it just touches on a lot of things yeah speaking of of those those battles with family i mean as somebody who who started acting professionally at, at 15 you must have had pretty supportive parents at that I did. I, I really did. Um, although there's a scene in Two Pianos, Four Hands, where the dad says, you know, you need to have something to fall back on. Mm. You can't just... Um, and for me, it wasn't it, it wasn't an argument that happened over music. It was an argument that happened over theater mm-hmm. um, because I was going to the National Theater School and there's no, there's no academic um, 
advantage to going there. You no. you can't you go there for three years, you get a piece of paper that says you went there, yeah. and that's all you get. Yeah. So and and there's no marks, there's no exams. Right. You're either asked to leave or you you are asked to stay, mm -hmm. um, and you do three years like that. Uh, really just to become a better actor no other yeah, reason yeah. to to go so there's nothing to fall back on yeah um but that's what i wanted uh, you know but that was puzzling for my dad where, where, what industry did your dad come from uh he was telephone repairman okay yeah so he certainly knew about um, he, i imagine he hoped that you would have something yeah i mean he was a he was a dutch my parents are dutch immigrants mm -hmm. so i'm a first generation canadian mm -hmm. so the canada was a new country for them and a new language and um, it's a very European thing to give your children classical music. It's, mm. it may be on the wane now. I don't know. Um, it isn't in some cultures. I still know in, in a lot of Asian families, it's a, mm. it's a mark of, um, uh, of something, yeah. of something important, yeah. something culturally important. It doesn't mean that people want you to be a piano player, but they'd like you to be a doctor who plays the piano. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, actually, one other thing that you, you sort of you sort of mentioned about you know you're not that interesting. Um, <laughs> just like, just in terms of like when people come and talk to you after a show, for a lot of actors that I've talked to uh, doing this this podcast, they will identify as being introverted, mm -hmm. which is the thing that a lot of people who are not in the industry mm -hmm. don't think of. Mm -hmm. Actually, they think actors mm -hmm. are going and extroverted and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, do you identify? Think of yourself as, as an introvert. Um, yeah, I mean, if if I decide to put on a you know a public persona, I decide to put it on. It's mm -hmm. not a natural thing to me. Yeah. It is natural on the stage for yes. me to become somebody else. But when I just have to be me, uh, mm -hmm. I I'm, I don't I don't know if it you know I, I I'm a bit tongue in cheek when I say I'm not that interesting. I don't f think that lowly of mm -hmm. myself. But I I don't also think that my opinion is any more interesting or that I'm any more interesting than any other human being, sure. um, you know, on the street. So yeah. I, th when I have to talk about myself, I get uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. As a, as, as somebody who, who, who does do that when, when there is like an opening or things like that, do, mm. how do you, and honestly, I'm looking for tips cause that's, cause you know, it's the thing that I struggle with. How do you deal with like talking to people and, and like trying to make, make conversation with people well like there's you know it depends on what's opening and what my relation to the show is so if it's a coal mine opening it's you know as as myself and diana as the two people who who you know are the coal mine it's our job mm -hmm. to to greet and be friendly and 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 have these conversations yeah. they're not the easiest or the funnest things but the it's worth it because it's your theater and you want people to feel they have access to you and that they're welcome and um so that's fine when it's me going to a friend show um i i don't really like to hang around for open night parties they don't they don't do anything for me really um uh, and i also think you know if you go backstage and talk to people you only have one job and that is to tell them how great it was no, and, yeah. and how great they were and yeah. if you're going to say something shitty then you just shouldn't go backstage you should just go home yeah you know? <laughs> Um, so th those are really the only rules mm. that I that I had. Mm. Those are those are good rules. <laughs> um, speaking of, of of the coal mine and 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 and, and being you know you with with your partner are the the coal mine. What I mean, what was the process of deciding that you were going to start this theater? Well, it, it sort of just came to be. We started with the motherfucker with the hat, which is our first show. Um, we were in a different location at that time underneath the, what was the magic oven west of here. And mm -hmm. we just decided we wanted to do this play. And so, uh, I, I bankrolled it basically mm -hmm. and, um, we got our money back and then we thought, let's do two more. And we asked uh, Tony, the, the owner of the magic oven, can we do two more? He said, yes, absolutely. And so we programmed two more shows and they were great hits as well. And then we thought, let's do it again next year. <laughs> we didn't really think let's create a theater ever. We just thought we were doing each show as it was. And then, you know, now it's five seasons later yeah. and now it sort of feels like a, a, a legitimate theater. Um, it's a, still a storefront. And I think the quality that we do is so high that people have an expectation that is, you know, almost not fair because of the limited resources we have and, mm. and how little money we have. And, our only um, money is ticket sales and donations. We've never yeah. had a grant. Um, we don't seem to be a grant-friendly um, theater, um, right. I think, because we don't 
uh, really have a mandate uh, or a political slant to mm. what we do. We just want to do great writing from all over the world, including Canada. And um, that's not really the arts organizations. The, the granting organizations right now are focused on uh, really worthy political mm. uh, ends right now that, that are important. And so we have to make this work without their help. Yeah. And, and that's okay. We're doing that. I think it is good that because I think that there's a there is a bit of an attitude in Canada that you need a grant to make things work. Right? Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, the the reality is, you know, we sell out every show. It's a tiny house; it only seats eighty people. So financially, we're at the end of our model because we make as much money as we possibly can doing what we're doing, and the the true economy of that is we can pay our actors about six hundred bucks a week. Mm. Um, and we can't do better than that without a grant. Sure. Um, but but still, that's most of the storefront theaters uh, in the country don't pay anywhere near that. And a lot of times, the actors do it for free yeah. because there's no money at the end of it. Yeah. Well, um, that's certainly the case. Yeah, and nobody's selling out like no. we are. So it, we're lucky, and and we have to figure out how to grow and. Uh, whether we, because we want to pay everybody more than that, but you know, we work for free for three years ourselves just because we love it. Yeah. You know, so a lot of people come here because they know they'll be involved in something really exciting and fun and of of a high quality. And that's what's most important to us. And so we get a lot of great actors who come here, um, and know that they're not going to, you know, make the rent, uh, but they want to have a meaningful experience. What is exciting for you about a space like this? Uh, uh, the intimacy, uh, first and foremost, is that you can be really close to uh, some great actors and seeing some great plays and, and hear every word. And, and it's so intimate, it's almost uh, embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's the, the key to this place. And also that it gets rejigged every single time. So that it's completely unrecognizable mm-hmm. from show to show because of the amazing designers that we're able to get yeah. in here. So it's fun for me to watch the audience go, oh, my God, this feels like a different play, a different place. You yeah. know? So that's cool. Do you find that, that, that actors, when they become aware of how intimate this space is, that it's a bit... <laughs> nerve-wracking for the I first? think I think initially it's nerve-wracking to have an audience member as close as you are to me right yeah. now um, but once they uh, experience it the the overwhelming I'd say all the actors who've worked here come away going oh my god that's the best to be that close to, mm. to the people is just amazing yeah you know and so that that's been a pretty universal experience for the for the actors here yeah, it, I've always found. I mean, at first, the first time I did a show that was that was in a very intimate space, I was freaked out. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, being able to feel the audience in a way that you can't in a very large space, and to be as aware of them, mm-hmm. um, was was really quite quite magical and yeah. exciting. Yeah, yeah, for <clears throat> um, sure. As 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 a, I mean, what. How did you find like this space? Did you did you just stumble? It's a across complete it? accident, yeah. and we were looking for a place because the the basement of the uh, magic oven, the magic oven, they left because they had a dispute with their landlord, mm-hmm. and the landlord said, "You guys can stay." And then we found out there was mold, and, oh. and so then we we found a pop up space again, a little around Donlands, yeah. and we rented it for two months, and we did a play called The River by Jez Butterworth. And that was our opening show. And then we were going to have our first um, sort of co-pro uh, with the inaugural production of Graham Abbey's company, Groundling Theater, to do Winter's Tale. And we didn't have a space. And so we were looking everywhere. And we were almost at the point where we were going to tell Graham, you're going to have, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't find a place. We, can't, we just can't do it. We wanted to stay on the Danforth. Yeah. I was driving past this place. Uh, noticing the magic oven, which had moved to this space right next door. Mm -hmm. And I saw people unloading stuff out this door. And I stopped the car and I came over and I said, what's going on? They said, well, we're getting out of here. And I said, can I look? And they said, okay. And I came (laughs) in, I looked and I went, oh my God, we could could make this work. And then I talked to Tony uh, at the magic oven and he knows the landlord. He's the same landlord, uh, owns both uh, buildings. And he got me in touch with him, and I said, this is what we want to do. Mm. And he said, okay. And and so then we gutted this place, yeah. and we worked our tails off. We had so many great people help us. Um, 
do all the work involved in um, turning this into a little bit of a theater. Uh, and we made it just in time for the opening of uh, wow. Winter's Tale. I think, I mean, the idea of having a, a, <clears throat> a bar space as well as the performance space, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's, a, it's a good separation and a place where people can sort of mingle and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I really... As far as some of the some of the, the the storefront spaces don't have anything. No, I know, I know. Well, that's Diana. She's yeah. she's incredible at figuring that stuff out. And mm. part of the experience of coming here is exactly that. It's mm. coming, getting a drink at the bar, talking, having a coffee if you want, and um, it, it sort of has the 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 feel of a theater, but it's still funky, and people still kind of appreciate that it's not yeah. um, soul pepper. It's not you know canadian stage it's not but it's it's something kind of cool and it also our audience is this neighborhood i mean yeah. there's, there's a hundred thousand people that can walk to this theater mm. and it's like an off off broadway that's yeah. our our model is off off broadway I, I heard somebody say once you know you can go see sam shepherd and be 10 feet away from him uh and and really great actors will come down and 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 do those shows for the same reasons that they come to the coal mine Mm. and i thought that's interesting and so we we sort of use that as a model in our heads that we're kind of we call ourselves off off broadview yeah (laughs) um and and that's what we are you know so people in this neighborhood have really really supported us and you know one of the differences if I go to another storefront show, I pretty much know the whole audience because mm. it's all just friends of the actors yes, and, yeah, um, yeah. you know, and a few other people. But ours is, I won't know a single person on, on any given night mm. here that's in the audience. And that's why we're sold out is because yeah. we have actual patrons. Have you have you done a lot of outreach to, to make those connections? No, or no. Just sort of... Family. It's it's been attraction rather than promotion, huh. um, uh, exclusively basically Facebook um, and and that's it. And and the press uh, has been great uh, to us. They have definitely noticed us and pointed us out. And I think people, you know, they see the reviews. We post reviews online, and um, they've pretty much been amazing for the whole five years. So it's been great. I mean, just as I was, just as I was coming, I noticed a few people just stopping to look in. The door. Everybody so does like, all day long. Yeah. People come in and, and ask us about it. Yeah. And the audience is still growing. You know, we started the first time we offered, uh, uh, a subscription was probably 200 and some, mm. then it was four, then it was six and now it's eight, um, 800. Huh. And, uh, so it's growing, uh, still. Do you, with, with, with 800 subscriptions, do you find that, that you're able to run shows longer? Uh, we're going to experiment with that starting next year. We're starting to do... We did a four-week run of The Nether, which was a co-pro with Studio 180, because mm-hmm. we thought if some of their audience comes and um, on top of ours, we'd probably get an extra week out of it. And we did. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started also with six shows a week because I have a pet peeve of theaters that do eight shows a week, no matter what. Yeah. And you do a couple of shows as an actor and there's nobody in, in the audience and yeah. it's, it just sucks. It's no fun. Yeah. Nobody likes it. The audience thinks they're at a, a dud yeah. and the actors are going, Oh my God, this is hard work for, you know, 30 people. Yeah. And, uh, we didn't want that. So I always thought, you know, if you could sell out six shows, then you add a show. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. The more often than not, of late, we're up to eight shows a week. But we always start with six a week and sell them out first. Did you did you do that from the beginning? Six yeah. Six shows a week? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. It, it, I've seen people shoot themselves in the foot by saying, we're going to do so many shows. We're going to start on a Tuesday. And you, you think to yourself, there's no way that you can... An audience is going to come to this little show on a Tuesday, and uh, invariably they don't. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that's the thing. So why yeah. are we doing it? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. are you? Yeah. Are, why are we doing it if there's no audience? If there's yeah. no people outside of your own friends and community, um, uh, call artistic community that want to see your show, then who are you doing it for? And uh, you know, we know who we're doing it for here. Yeah. And I think that's part of our strength. How long did it take for your audience to, to start coming in like this? Like, it, it's been pretty much sold out since we started. Mm. Um, so, yeah, again, yeah, it's a perfect storm. I don't, uh, you know, I don't, we don't say that it's just, the, you know, the, the excellence that we're putting up, which mm. we believe in. Um, it's also this neighborhood and Toronto, the way Toronto is sort of shaking down lately is you don't really want to get in your car and go to the West End if you mm. live in the East End. Um, you know, I have friends doing shows all over and a lot of times I don't go simply because it's a 45 minute drive each way. It adds an hour and a half to my night. Yeah. So if you're out here and you have something great in your neighborhood, 
you're going to go to it. You're going to support it. And yeah. so we have all these people who are just ecstatic. They go to dinner here. The parking's free on the street. Um, or they walk, yeah. you know, and it's it's their theater. And they really feel an ownership of it. Well, I do think that I remember being in, in Montreal a number of years ago and, and noticing that, like, it felt like so many neighborhoods had a theater that was theirs. Yeah. And I, I thought that's something that is missing. Yeah. In, in Toronto, because we we put all of our theaters in in downtown. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so also, that, there's not there's not a sort of an appetite of people who aren't in our world to go to a theater like this. They think going to the theater means going to Les Mis. They think yes, going to the theater yeah. means going to a Mervis show. Yeah. Um, and when they learn that they can come and be this close to, you know, the, mm-hmm. the caliber of actors we have here, yeah. second to none in the world. Um, and, and they're right, like they're so close and they go, oh my God. And at, even at, you know, with all the charges and everything in 50 bucks a ticket, Mm -hmm. it's a third of what you're going to pay to go somewhere else and pay 20 bucks to park and have a hundred dollar meal on top of it. So it's also, it it makes economic sense. Um, People really like it. I think it does subvert because there are a lot of people who think that they just can't afford to go to the theater. Yeah. You know, they, if, if what they're seeing are. Mervish prices and things yeah. like that, then, yeah. then they're convinced they can't afford it. Yeah. But this sort of like is an opportunity for them to to go to theater they can't afford. Yeah, and they, they dip their toes in here and then they go, that's really fun, that's really mm. great, and we loved it and we, we want to come back. And yeah. uh, it's been incredible, it's mm. been amazing. Um, when you guys are, when you've finished your season each year, do you do you close up shop? What do you what, what do you We do pretty much do. Yeah, we we have some ideas um <clears throat> to to have what we call summer programming, but it's never going to be a show show. Mm-hmm. Um and we're never going to rent it out uh, to other people mm-hmm. because one of the things I found watching other theaters is once they start to rent them out, no one knows whether it's part of your season or wh- mm-hmm. no matter how hard you try, unless yeah. you have a lot of money to make that clear. Um, so people can rent your theater and do a really crappy show and you might get these same people I'm talking about going, Oh my God, there's a show on, let's go. And they go, Oh my God, that was awful. Yeah. Um, and we just don't want to set ourselves up for that. Um, so we we're our brand is, is we really are protecting it and we only do four shows a year. Mm. So they're also, those four shows are very special shows. And because there's only four, we can, you know, make sure to our best, to the best of our ability, that they're really great shows. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still an incredible amount of work. <laughs> I mean, when you're when you're choosing shows that are going to be your four shows for mm-hmm. the year, we've talked a little bit about what a coal mine show is. But how do you do these things come to you? Do you seek them out? How do they sometimes do they? people send us play? Well, people send us plays every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, every day. Um, and that's amazing. Some sometimes I get to read some of them. Basically, we read plays all year mm. long, uh, and um, read reviews from uh, mostly from London and New York, um, also from other places in the world. Like we just did The Father, which is a French hit, um, uh, and we did the translation. Uh, so really, from from everywhere, we read reviews and. We are very curious online uh, with, you know, what people think are great plays. And then we try to seek them out and, you know, see if it'll work for us. Mm. We can't compete um, with the bigger theaters in terms of getting the rights. Because mm-hmm. if they're going to give their... We also have only done Toronto mm. premieres. So most playwrights and playwrights agents are going to want the Toronto premiere to be in a theater that pays their playwright a lot more money than, yeah. we, than we can, right? So... Uh, but we now have a little bit of a reputation whereby mm. the agents are starting to say, this is the cool theater. Right. If you want to make a little splash in Toronto, this is the place to, to bring. So we've, we've managed to get some really amazing world premieres and, yeah. and uh, not world, Canadian premieres and Toronto premieres. Well, Hand to God is certainly one of those. I remember yeah. reading a lot of buzz about that when it was playing. In yeah, and The Father and The Nether yeah. from this season. They're, those are major yeah. plays that are being done all over the world. Yeah. And that's the other thing about the grant system is that the grant system doesn't really allow for Torontonians to see these plays. Mm. Because we don't have a commercial theater um, economy, uh, other great cities get to see these plays all the time. And sure. they don't care where they're from. They don't no. Like in New York or Chicago... 
they're not whining about it not being American. No. They're, they're happy to see a Canadian play. They're yes. happy to see a British play. They're happy to see an Australian play. We have a bit of a kind of thing about it still where we, we think that the only thing that we can support is Canadian theater. And I argue, you know, Canadian theater, this is Canadian theater. Mm. This is, this is Canadian theater. This is amazing theater artists doing some of the best plays in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was there, was Hand to God, for example, since that's the place that's coming up, yeah. is since it's a, a Canadian premiere, um, a play like that, like you were saying, it could have been done at a larger theater. Was it the reputation of Coal Mine that... that uh, I believe, I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. I mean, I think also that the bigger theaters, there, there's just no way the Mervish audience would put up with this script. <laughs> Um, no, that's, you know, that's true. Uh, as for Canadian stage, I think you know it could have been a Berkeley show. Mm. I think Soul Pepper could have done it, um, but again, their audience is maybe not up for this. Mm. Uh, our audience kind of likes to be a little bit bad, um, and, and and they like they like the notion that they're seeing something that's kind of subversive and right. uh, and challenging. You know, it, that's kind of a rare thing in some audiences. Yeah, so it's good that you've been able to, to yeah. find those people. Yeah, well, there's only 80 of them a night. That's true. So. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> if we had a 500 seat theater, I don't know how well we'd be doing. True, but I mean, it, it, there's. Do you feel like if you were to to be able to find a space that could fit more people, that it wouldn't be the coal mine anymore? Uh, yeah, we've talked about that a lot. I think I don't think we would ever want to go beyond uh, 200 um, mm. in terms of the coal mine, unless we, you know, in some weird universe where. We could get a 500 seat theater and and a 200 seat theater, and then we would do in the 500 seat theater. We would do theater that belongs in a 500 seat theater. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that happens a lot in this town is very intimate plays get done on huge stages, and it doesn't translate well at That's all. It, it doesn't. It's just. It's not meant to be in a big theater. Yeah. You know, and some of our theaters are barns. You know, and and they don't. It doesn't go well. No, not everything can be on a on a on a stage that. It's right, like people. you wouldn't want to see the father at the Blue Moon Hell. No, you just you just no. wouldn't want to. You would you would lose a lot. And, You'd and, lose an incredible yeah. amount. Yeah. So there's something about 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 the intimacy of a space that really yeah. plays into it. Yeah. 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 Um, is there is is a larger space something that you dream of or that you think of? Or yeah, we think? we definitely do. Um, uh, we we don't quite know how we're going to make it work, but we have we do have an amazing sort of you know, angels and supporters that I think are behind what we're doing and watching us. And um, we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll see how it goes. We want to stay on the Danforth. We want to stay in the East End. Um, maybe, you know, maybe take over a bigger chunk of this block. Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things we talk about, we dream sure. about all the time. Sure. Those, those angels and supporters, did, are they people that you courted or did you did they find you? Much like your audience. They found us. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's been it's it's been amazing that way. I mean, I to a fault. I don't really solicit because <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I don't want that to be who I am. I, I want to concentrate on on doing the, the the art part. I don't mind talking to people who have money and and you know getting them to come see shows mm -hmm. and. And, and everything else, um, but I, I love it when they come to us, mm -hmm. and that's that's how it starts. Uh, I found I, I found that with our audience, and I found mm -hmm. that with our our benefactors is is that they've they've somehow found us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's I guess quality of work. I hope so. Yeah, I, I like to think so. Awesome. Well, Ted, thank you so much for talking. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. This has been a Homebody Productions production.